uh, all of that is a complete lie. But, yeah. So to, today's surprise topic is... Not Harry Styles. Sorry. Wrong. There we go. Excellent. Um, we'll get to that shortly. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot to take Harry out of the last one. But it's always good to be reminded he exists. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you that in a second. So I'll just run through the group norms. Uh, play the ball. Sorry? I know, I know. I didn't get it set up. I don't know. Um, play the ball, not the player. Just my opinion is not an answer. Be willing to be challenged. No name calling. You can be passionate. You don't have to say anything. And disagreement is not disrespect. Um, forgiveness, that's the topic of today's Theo Cafe. So, I thought what we'd do is we'd start with um, a really good chart made by, uh, 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 what do you call it, an organisation of psychiatrists, about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. So, you won't be able to read this because our, um, our projector's horrendous, but... Forgiveness is letting go of resentment, anger and hostility towards someone who treated you unfairly, even though you are justified in those feelings. Forgiveness is not condoning, approving of or excusing what happened. Forgiveness is recognising the wrongdoer as human and treating them decently despite what they did. It is not forgetting how you were wronged or pretending like nothing happened. Forgiveness is a chance to amend a relationship that was damaged if you choose to do so. Forgiveness is not an agreement to continue a a relationship as it was. After forgiving someone, you can choose to resume, modify or end the relationship. Forgiveness is a mental shift or change of heart that develops over time. Forgiveness is not simply saying, I forgive you without meaning it. In fact, you can forgive without ever saying so. Forgiveness is a process that can start at any time. You can even forgive a person who is no longer in your life. It is not something you do for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is an opportunity to heal. Forgiveness can reduce symptoms of trauma, anger, anxiety and depression. Additionally, it can increase hope and self-esteem. But forgiveness is not getting even or getting revenge. Getting even might feel good in the moment, but unlike forgiveness, it does not resolve anger and resentment. Forgiveness is a personal decision that only you can make for yourself. No one can make you forgive another person. Forgiveness is not something that can be forced just because you want to forgive doesn't mean that forgiveness has been achieved. What a, we'll go back just for a second. What do we feel about that, that graph there? I think it's a pretty, pretty good, pretty full explanation there. And we'll touch on those things as we go through. Alrighty, now we've got a scripture, piece of scripture. Uh, Jesus, oh, sorry. Jesus liked to use parables to illustrate various aspects of forgiveness. During his conversation with Peter, Jesus told the parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember that one? Luke's gospel has a series of five forgiveness parables. This is is not a small deal in scripture. Forgiveness is a big deal. The barren fig tree, the bent over woman, the lost sheep, and the lost coin, and the greatest forgiveness parable of all, the prodigal son. Now, we're going to have to fast forward through a few of these because they're, they're just things that stuck around from the last one. So if we go to the, the picture, yeah, just keep going through them. Excellent. So I put up here some pictures from, that relate to, to Scripture of instances where Jesus forgave. So can we pick where this one's coming from? That's a picture of the woman who's about to be stoned when she's caught in the act of adultery. We all know what Jesus did there. I've mentioned it a million times before. A huge act of forgiveness that showed those who were using judgment and power uh, that what they were doing was ridiculous and fruitless. 
Next one. The woman at the well. The society uh, made, well, placed a, a, a dirty label on her. Uh, she was outcast from the rest of the society, otherwise she wouldn't have been there by herself, certainly not in the heat of the day. Jesus made it very clear that he knew that she had five husbands and the one that she was with now was not her husband, yet he doesn't give any judgment at all, at all on that. In fact, he sends her into the village as an apostle to those people. So that one is stretching forgiveness a bit because it's almost like Jesus didn't see the need for forgiveness. He didn't even mention that. But it's a, it's a good example of things that we, I think even still today, may judge others for uh, that Jesus didn't. Next one. What's oh, this scene? It's the, the three that were crucified together. You, you know the, the old story. <clears throat> one said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, the, the guy beforehand had, had explained that they were there justly. All he had to say to Jesus was, remember me. And Jesus said, look, you'll be with me today in paradise. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Next one. What's this one? Uh, that's, that's a... That was taken on a cheap camera, that one. It wasn't as good. Um, so this is the big one. This is Judas, right? Jesus seemed to know what was going to happen. Someone was going to betray him. Comes to the garden. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus never damns Judas. Jesus never curses him. Jesus doesn't say because he's done this, he's going somewhere else. It just happens. And on the cross, he forgives everyone. Next one. Uh, oh, yes, this one. This is, this is good. So another thing we may completely miss about forgiveness, which is actually a huge example in the Bible, is that the stoning of, Peter, uh, stoning of Stephen... Paul was apparently there, certainly in the legends, and he was standing around watching it happen, because that was right. He was a Pharisee at the time. I, th there would have been countless amounts of people that Paul would have supported stoning, and being a head Phar or, or a well-known Pharisee, he probably threw some of those stones himself, and that is, that's absolutely directly against anything that Jesus said. Yeah, some, yeah, yep. Uh, so they would use some sort of fist-sized rocks or whatever, but yeah, they'd get boulders and... <clears throat> yep. Um, but the, the, cra the crazy thing about this is Paul was then used by God, complete forgiveness on that road, but that led to him having an absolute 180 and giving his life up for the life of others through Christ. So... It ended up with him being imprisoned and him accepting that. But that is a huge amount of forgiveness to give anyone when they've been caught up in this act. Next one. <laughs> this one's uh, probably the most accurate of all the pictures. We, we, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> um, yep, you got it. This is the turn the other cheek one. I couldn't find any good pictures. Um, Although this is fantastic. So we've got the slap. Now, this, this is great because you think, well, how, how does that, what does that have to do with forgiveness? I hope, I hope you're thinking that. Maybe not. Um, but I've said a few times I've explained this in different sermons and Theo Cafe gives me the ability to actually give a bit of evidence and explain how I came to that, um, which you can't do in a sermon because it would bore everyone to death. Um, so if you go to the next one, the slap. This is really important. A slap in this society was a great insult, right? A backhanded slap was far more demeaning. In the Bhava Kama, Mishnah, the traditional Jewish interpretation of the law, a slap incurred a fine of 200 silver, right? But a backhanded slap required a payment of 400, doubled, right? The same amount as for spitting on someone, which they saw as ultimately absolutely unclean, which I hope we still do today. It was more than violence. It was degrading. It was what you gave to an inferior or to a slave. 
Here's the kicker. Imagine you're a low-class slave in the ancient Roman world, right? You are powerless, quite absolutely legitimately powerless. You are marginalised in the biggest way possible. Your life is not your own. It, it belongs to someone else. You try to, want, uh, to try to run away would be a death sentence if you, were, if you were a slave, right? Then one day, like so many other days, your master backhands you, right? Yeah, it's normal. Just a bit of a backhand from the master. He expects you to cower and whimper and slink off back to your duties. Maybe he expects you to get on your knees and beg forgiveness. But instead, you look at him in the eyes and you turn your head to put your left cheek forward. Very important for us to remember that the scripture doesn't just say turn the other cheek. It says turn your right cheek. That's super important, right? You've already insulted him by failing to break down, so he has the right, in his mind, and in society's mind, to slap you again. Clincher, next one. But he can't slap you with his left hand, because that is unclean for both of you. You don't use it. There was no such thing as a left-handed person back in the society. And he can't backhand, because your right cheek is away from him. To strike again, his only option is to slap you with the palm of his hand and this was not the way to slap a slave. This was reserved for equals. Uh, if he chose to slap you again, he is forced to upgrade your status. He has to bump you up to a higher class citizen in order to get his revenge. That's the genius of turn the other cheek. It's not about being meek and mild and just let them do it to you. It's turn your right cheek, engage, make them see you as an equal. That's absolutely powerful stuff. But we completely miss it 2,000 years later. Because thankfully we don't have those same laws and understandings in our society. No, the right-hand side cheek. Does. Yep. Can't be left. He can't hit you with the left hand. He has to hope, hit you with an open. Mm. It's absolutely genius. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a general understanding of that, but many different cultures in India and stuff don't follow that anymore. Um, but I, I guess so. I don't know why universally the left hand has been so hated. Um, I'm certainly a completely unclean person um, being left-handed, but, uh, but it is. So I wanted to give a big, broad overview of all of the different types of forgiveness that Jesus... Uh, shows, right? And as I said this morning, when it comes to priests uh, ordained in all of the mainline traditions, we, we are charged with whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, it would be very easy for us to hear that and then, quite rightfully, because that's what it says, say, so, okay, well, it's, it's my choice as to whether I forgive them of their sins or retain that sin, which is what we're told. However, if we look at Jesus' ministry, which is who we are here to emulate, there is only one way to do that, and that's to forgive. Now, that doesn't mean anything goes, and for example, they can't do this anymore because we have one person in the diocese that um, is allowed to hear these confessions, right? But if somebody came to a priest and said, look, I've done something horrible to a child, part of the uh, reconciliation of that person would have to be to immediately turn themselves in for then forgiveness to be given. Because if they're not willing to do that, to face the consequences, then I highly doubt they're actually repentant. So, Forgiveness certainly isn't easy. And just before I open it up to the floor as well, um, one thing 
that we need to clarify is that judgment and forgiveness are not kind of intertwined like this. So if, if somebody... I'm trying to use a different example because this one is used all the... Well, I think I've used it a few times, but all the time. If somebody is living... And I'm not making a personal statement about this, but if somebody's living in a relationship that you don't agree with, that you are absolutely convinced is not okay, it's somehow sinful, right? Um, you may judge that and judge how they're living, but they don't require any forgiveness from you because they've done absolutely nothing wrong to you. It's just that you just don't like the way that they're living. So... That's a fairly important distinction to make as well. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. I have been 15 minutes, and I promise that it would only be 15 minutes. Are there any concerns, questions, uh, disagreements, anything like that about forgiveness? Uh, minefields that I've managed to dodge or that I'm ignoring? Um, any thing at all? Something about the Christian God and forgiveness? Does anybody have an opinion? This has a very long lead on it. You can go anywhere. There's some pretty big questions that I think are low-hanging fruit that are going around in my head that I don't want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. A book that I've read is called Forgiving Dead Men Walking. Wow. I don't know whether anybody's ever seen the movie Dead Men Walking, but it's about a couple that um, get attacked and he's killed and she's um, abused. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she writes this book, Forgiving Dead Men Walking, mm. the, the girl who was actually abused, who, whose boyfriend was killed while they were on their date. Mm. And... Um, she, somebody said to her that one of the things that she didn't have to do, and it came out in that, that you don't have to go back to a relationship with that person because you never had one. Mm. And the mm. only way that she finally came to being able to say forgive, she forgive, gave them was because she realised he was somebody's son mm. and that God made him special too. Mm. But um, it's, it's a really hard book to read. Yeah, I couldn't imagine and I think that that's an extremely important thing for, um, I think, Christian leaders to start speaking out about more now, um, is that uh, forgiveness does not mean going back to an abusive relationship. It really doesn't um, at all. And forgiveness is the person's choice. It's not for us to force them to forgive or to shame them into forgiving. Uh, forgiveness is incredibly freeing, but the person needs to make that choice. I'm being critical now. What's Good. What's new? <laughs> uh, there's some handles in the... Um, Do I have to take information? Just, yeah, there's a little information sheet if you just ask for their name, their phone number and their... When you were t talking before, in the 15 minutes, 17 and a half... Sorry. Um, you weren't, to my way of thinking, quite clear on the difference between forgiveness and revenge. Sure. And there's a big difference. Massive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd hoped that that first graph had hit on that. Um, revenge... Well, revenge really is the opposite of forgiveness, almost. Or well, it is an opposite of forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're trying to get revenge for something that's been done to us, then we're saying, okay, well then, I'm happy to be of the same character of that person and do a very similar thing to them. So then how can we say that what they did is wrong? I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, I mean, these are all natural things for us to feel, especially when we've just been stung. But I think part of being a faith person or even just an ethical, moral person in society, is that you can then process those feelings uh, and find healthier ways to move forward. Hang on. This one. 
Good. An interesting leap on that is now that I've got my revenge on you, I forgive you. Mm. 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 Just throwing it to you. <laughs> we forget that forgiveness isn't for the other person. Mm. It's actually for the givee. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some pretty... And I, I'm happy for people to disagree with me on this. I'm happy for people to disagree with me on anything, really. But um, there's a few sayings that have become really general and colloquial that are thrown around that really relate to forgiveness. Things like, um, you know, I love you, but I don't have to like you. I d being, a, being a parent, I don't know how you get to the point of not liking your child, but can still say that you love them. But that's not what's said in that saying, is it? Yeah. That's a tricky one. What about, and here's the really low-hanging fruit, and this, this goes into far bigger theological discussion, and uh, whether we go there or not is another thing. What about people like Hitler? How does anybody forgive that? Should they forgive that? And what does that look like? To me, that was the low-hanging fruit that just was sitting there waiting. To... Sorry? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Maureen. There's a difference between forgiving and judging. We judge Hitler very harshly. Yes, good. And quite rightly so. <laughs> But um, we shouldn't. We aren't the people to judge him. Correct. In spite of the fact that had they got him to the Nuremberg trials, he would have been judged <laughs> well and truly. But he didn't get there. Yeah, and I think when it comes to people like you and I, and I think just about everybody else here, forgive me if I'm wrong. If you were in the Holocaust, um, it's it, it's not for us to forgive that because we weren't caught up in it. And it's certainly not for us to tell people who were where they should be on that path of forgiveness. But it is for us to tell the world that it happened. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And then the question from that goes on to, well, where does God sit in all of that? But where is... So much, so much came out of that hmm. with individual people, with individual things where God really was there. Yep, yep. But I don't for one moment think he went behind Hitler. Really ex um, interesting extension to the comment about forgiving Hitler. Um, <laughs> if you extend it and say, well, Hitler... Um, let's call it cohabitated, um, with the Japanese. Mm. So he had an alliance with the Japanese. The Japanese then per perpetuated crimes against Australia, others. Sure. Um, and for one who's lost a grandfather to that regime, um, by extension, they've offended me. Sure. And then that forgiveness needs to come from me back to them mm. so that I don't carry a grudge. So I think it's mm. not necessarily just that intimate connection mm -hmm. in terms of you've done something to me, therefore there's the course or the direction of the forgiveness. Mm. I think there's a much muddier mm. course that needs to also be taken in terms of how that extended effect affects others down down the line. Yes. Um, I've got a letter at home, well, I've got a number of letters, but I've got a letter at home that mum sent to her father in the concentration camp mm. that was never, ever delivered, mm. but it came back to her. Mm. Um, sorry, not the concentration camp, out of the Japanese 
POW camps. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> at Santa Can. Um, so that came back to her. Mm. Um, but she's managed to not carry that baggage through her life. Mm. So I think there's a real muddy connection mm. in terms of the forgiveness and how far that extends to the broader circle, I guess. Yeah, that's great. And I think you've opened up the door now that I hadn't thought of until you just started speaking, Bob, into cultures and societies and how generational um, hurts and effects run through those. So, uh, for example, a society that was uh, enslaved or uh, that was extremely harshly oppressed, it's much, much, much more difficult for that society to get a foot up and to be constructive and active in, in society because of the generations that, that's been passed down to. So if you've been broken and have nothing and your parents raise you with nothing, you don't have access to good education, you don't have access to good nutrition, then there's a million different paths you can go down and then people can start seeing your culture or your people as a problem. When actually the initial oppression or enslavement or whatever is what caused that problem in the first place. So then there's all these different forgiveness circles going on and how do you dig through that? Well, Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. is until very recently the story has never been told. Hmm. And still isn't. People still say Aborigines didn't build houses. They hmm. did. Hmm. Stone ones. Hmm. Lies of omission, those sort of things. Hmm. Hmm. Depended on the area in which they were living. If they required it, they built it. Hmm. They farmed, they grew crops of grass. Mm. Yes, and I, I think as faith people, one of the biggest things that I think would be a challenge and the things, I think all of us have probably broken this direction at some point, is that before you come to the altar, forgive anyone that you have an issue with. I'm sure just about all of us here would have not done that and still come to the altar at some point. But these are, these are core things of our faith, things that are raised over and over and over again in the Bible. And yet stuff like this doesn't get spoken of anywhere near as much as some things that are mentioned a handful of times and aren't even agreed upon. Which is why these kind of discussions are really important. It's interesting, the, the physical act of forgiving doesn't actually need to occur. Mm. Because it's personal, such a personal thing. Mm. And it really is a journey. And I think sometimes if we are trying to heavily encourage someone to forgive, because we're sort of outside of the situation and we can see how it could be a forgivable thing, then we can actually damage that journey of forgiveness for them. And they may never even get there. Hmm. And sometimes, just out of safety and respect for those around you, you may need to not have someone in your life anymore uh, and yet continue that journey of forgiveness. But they may never have a place back in your life for a billion different reasons. Any other comments? And Jesus was... He, he never said these things directly, but he was pretty clear about us being able to be honest with ourselves and so as in that graph up there we may deeply want to forgive 
we may know that that's the best road, but trying to convince ourselves that we've forgiven when we haven't is not useful. So we need to do that, that painful work of admitting to ourselves that we haven't actually forgiven them um, and not beating ourselves up for that, but knowing that we're still continuing down that journey. Isn't that part of the process, though? What's that? That change process that uh, Paula has said she's going through. Yeah. Like if you look at any sort of chart on how change happens, mm. uh, then you've got the resistance, no, 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 I'm not going to do it, mm. and then all of a sudden you get into the depths of almost despair and then you start to get acceptance mm. and all of a sudden you start to move towards the change. Mm. So it, it's part of the, I would have thought it's part of the change process and to be even thinking it mm. um, is a good thing yeah. whether or not it's acceptable in, as, a, as, a, as a completion of the change is a whole different discussion but mm. I would have thought it was a good thing because yeah. the thought process is there. Mm. Yeah, certainly not a bad thing. I, I wasn't trying to say that at all. Yeah. Um, but the forgiveness hasn't happened. No. But it's still part of the journey. Yeah. Hmm. Brian, you look like you're getting up. Yeah, but I wasn't going to answer your question. Oh, that's all right. No, no, no. Go, go to whatever else. I was just throwing that out. Oh, just a few thoughts wrapping around. I think there's no need for forgiveness unless someone's been hurt. So already you've got a uh, delicate situation because if someone hasn't wronged you, mm. there's no need to forgive. Correct. Like, and it's, it's the wrong and that sense or the need for justice or the want for justice that creates things like vengeance and wanting to get even or to harm that person or to do back to them, you know, like in the Old Testament, the eye for eye type arrangement. Mm. So, so I think they're like, but I, I think for, forgiveness... Um, there's also fits in, at least in my mind, fits into the pattern that Jesus said on another occasion, take up your cross daily and follow me. Mm. So why does he want us to essentially make a daily commitment to follow him? And I, I think that's what forgiveness is. It's a, a need to walk in the decision that you made yesterday, today, Mm. and on into the future mm. because we still won't be able to escape the hurt mm. that that wrong brought into our life it'll it to some degree will always be there but our response to it is the act of forgiveness mm. um, and ultimately my choice to forgive releases me it doesn't do anything for anyone else mm. so it's a decision that I make for my own benefit. Mm. Now, I wouldn't call it selfish, but like it is focused, in my mind, forgiveness is focused on me benefiting mm -hmm. more than anyone else. Mm. Now, as I look at other people's situations, I could well say, I don't know how they forgive. That is a deep hurt. It's not like a, just a nick of the knife on your hand when you're cutting up your onions. Mm. It's like you nearly sliced your finger off or... Something like that, you know. Some things are really painful and always will be. Yeah, mm. yeah thanks, Brian. Enough, no, no, it was great. Thanks, Brian. What do we think about God's forgiveness? Sorry? I wanted to leave it quite open. Uh, to us, to God's creation, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to bite. Go. That's why I said it. Um, I, I think much of the instruction around forgiveness derives from the idea that for us to gain forgiveness from God requires us to be practising forgiveness. And then he tells that parable about this person who owed a little bit versus this person who owed a lot and saw the injustice in that and said, well, OK. I guess it's a reminder to us that God has a lot more to forgive than we'll ever need to forgive, if you want to put it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. That, uh, again, we're all, we're all believers here, I would think. So we have no problem with the idea of God 
understanding who he, she, uh, they are mm. is um, a challenge for all of us. And we, we process that. But um, when, when God sets out some guidelines and we don't live by that, uh, then at least from God's perspective, mm. there's a need for forgiveness because we've essentially done something wrong. Mm. And, uh, and, and then, so I think God just looks at it and it says to us, well, I've suffered, you're suffering, but if you practice forgiveness, then you're actually going to be in a place to be liberated and freed and uh, overcome some of those sorts of things. So mm. I guess that's in God's heart as well. Mm. Anyway, Very nice. That's me thinking without thinking. If the passage to eternal life is accepting Jesus Christ and those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their saviour, where do they stand mm. at death? Mm. So it's rather bewildering. I've sort of um, consoled myself that uh, God knows the person's heart. So therefore we'll all be judged according to the word that speaks like that. Mm. But um, I really wonder if anybody would be rejected by God mm. because God sort of um, creates and recognises the depth of your heart. Mm. And um, there seems to be a lot of good in some people, even criminals, that um, naturally just human beings have hope that um, criminals will come to know a better way of life. So um, I just think that's a consoling thought, mm. but it um, doesn't seem to match up exactly with the word of, the word of our Bible mm. um, when they speak of um, if the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ, where do the rest stand who don't? Mm. Except Christ. That's it. Yep. So as far as God, where does forgiveness stand with God? Um, that's about the only consolation I have. Yeah, Jeff, you've just basically uh, demonstrated an extremely mature faith. So you've... doesn't doesn't completely line up with Scripture. Well... When we see the Old Testament reading we had a few weeks ago, where all of the sons were walking past, it clearly states in that scripture, God sees differently, God sees the heart of the person. Now that is in scripture. What is not in scripture, yet we all think it is nowadays, is to receive salvation, all you have to do is accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. It doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. Jesus doesn't say it. Paul doesn't say it. You know who did say it? Billy Graham. That's where that comes from. Uh, excellent evangelist. Goes right through America. Comes through here. All of a sudden, that's the thing that's super important and baptism's out, all that sort of stuff. But um, it, that doesn't mean it's not a good thing or that it's not important. It is, absolutely. But I think you're... Well, you've, you've clearly thought deeply and prayed about it and th the position that you've just expressed actually seems to line up with much more scripture than the other. And when Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father except through me, he didn't say nobody comes to the Father unless they bow down and worship me, uh, unless they, a million other clauses, he said except through me. So that's either a choice of Jesus or a following of how Jesus is. We tend to then confuse that with unless you subscribe to a certain denomination, which is not what was said. But that was beautifully articulated, Jeff. <laughs> Mine's just a conundrum. Um, we have an, an answer to you, or a, a question to answer your question. Hmm. Um, we have a God that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Mm -hmm. We have a God that 
drowned the world mm. and we have a God still God, um, and we have a God that sent Jesus into the world and gave his only son mm. to us mm. um, as, a, as an act of forgiveness to everything else that we've done beforehand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got these massive, and there's plenty of other examples in the Bible, but we've got these massive opposites mm -hmm. um, when you start to read about God. Mm. Big paradoxes, yeah. As opposed to Jesus and his time with us. Hmm. Absolutely. And we Jesus also... seemed to be consistent, mm. whereas God has seemed to be inconsistent. Mm. And in the, the tales of the Hebrews, we also have a God that actually didn't seem very smart because why did God not just strike down the pharaohs instead of killing all these little children? Why bother with... 10 plagues that are going to hurt a bunch of innocent people and not just strike down the pharaohs. All good questions. But that, that then digs into how we understand scripture, uh, how we understand God, um, how the communities who wrote those scriptures understood what they were communicating. Um, how other scriptures which are very similar, like um, uh, 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 what do you call it, Mesopotamian creation stories, um, how they relate, all that kind of stuff. But you pointed out a really good, a really good point in that there is uh, quite a paradox between the Jesus and the inspired stories of the, the, other, the God from the ancient Hebrews. Um, now, you'll have many different theologians who will come at different angles. Some will just do a million different backflips and try and make it smooth and, and make it all make sense, and others will come at it in a very different way. Um, I certainly can't answer that question. I suspect we'll find the answer when we stand in front of you. Yeah. Quite possibly, yeah. It won't matter then. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> there was a thing that was touched on um, that has a name that is very, very difficult for people either, it, it's quite polarizing actually, funnily enough, and there was a very, very well-known church father, Origen of Alexandria, who purported this. Um, there's a, a, a thing known as universalism, right? So that is that every child of God, which is everyone, is eventually forgiven and gets to be with God. So, there's, like all scripture, there's scriptures people will use to absolutely attack universalism, and then other people will say, well, it says in scripture that God wants all people to be reunited with God, so does God get what God wants or not? Yeah, I struggle with this forgiveness thing. I'll be honest. Yep, that's all right. I'll pull their mic down for you so you can see it. Just tilt it. Yep, perfect. Yeah, I struggle with this forgiveness thing. Um, I want to forgive. I think I'll forgive. But it's really hard when the perpetrator of damage is still doing damage mm. and affects me in a roundabout way. Sure. And, um, of course, I have my mental health issues because of the damages done, too. So, and it's not just a perpetrator. There were many. Mm. Um, universalism, you brought it up. Mm. I had an unusual dream just prior to my heart attack that I had last year. Mm. Was it last year? Year before. <laughs> and uh, 2021. In that dream, I was made aware that I hadn't actually forgiven <laughs> um, because I was figuring, oh, well, I can't judge. God will be the judge. I'm just glad I won't be in your shoes at that time. Mm. Mm. That was a nice, clean aspect, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I thought, just got free there. <laughs> 
yeah, I've forgiven now, but in this dream, mm. I dreamt the multitude were all there waiting for God's decision. Everything, curtains, giant, you know, everything, Christ returned. Judgment day has come. Mm. And everyone stepped forward to look into the book of life, which is their story. And Jesus, God, through Jesus, pronounced grace, grace. And my little voice crept up. Hmm. Don't know who it was who stood up. Could be any number of the people who have done me harm. And I went, grace? That's not what I expected. Hmm. That was my reaction. Many more in the crowd were doing the same thing. Murmur, 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 like the Israelites when they <laughs> left Egypt. Murmur, murmur. And then I realised God is the God of forgiveness. He, we're told that. Mm. And if I was one of those who had to come up, look in my book of life, and find that God would find something there but pronounce grace, mm. that's what I would want. Mm. So therefore, I think others that have done me harm would want that grace too. Mm. Mm. And it melt my heart that time. Mm. And I did recognise I still had judgement. <laughs> mm. So I really do need that grace for myself. Sure. So that helped you realise that the forgiveness that you'd, you'd given was conditional on them getting a pound of flesh later on. Yeah. There's a, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, certainly the Greek Orthodox tradition, have a very interesting idea about the fire of God's love. So they would teach that when, when you know, believers or non-believers, whatever, uh, die, that we are all uh, consumed by the same fire of God's love. But for those who have learned to love, those who have followed the path of Christ those who have, you know, learnt forgiveness, compassion, agape type love, that sort of thing, this far as ecstasy. It's absolute beauty and love and wonder, right? But for those who have lived their lives judging others, holding on to anger, uh, putting themselves above others, that love is unbearable. It's the same fire, but it's unbearable for those who have not learnt to love here on earth. So that's a really interesting way of describing kind of the end times. It's a type of universalism, but people just don't get off scot-free. They're refined through that process. Lovely. Here's a curly one. Mm -mm. Is Mahatma Gandhi in heaven? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that. I wouldn't have a clue, not being God, but uh, I would suspect it. We, we can so easily fall into the trap of anyone we don't agree with not going to heaven, you know. It's a very easy trap to fall into. When you talk of forgiveness, mm. um, Jesus said the only way to the Father is through him. Mm. Um, Mahatma Gandhi will... Yeah, there are others too, but he, he's a classic. Mm. Um, worked all his life mm. for the sake of others, mm -hmm. but didn't believe in Jesus. Yes. Loved Jesus, didn't like the Christians. That's right, yeah. mm. uh, And Mother Teresa makes that even more complicated. But she was a Christian. She was a Christian, and she certainly gave her life to ministry, but she also needlessly and certainly in some situations abused people, refusing them painkillers, uh, refusing them uh, the, the help that they needed to deal with the pain that they had because of her absolute conviction that suffering produces character and faith. Um, and we can try and pretty it up, but that's abuse. Somebody's there in excruciating pain and you refuse them painkillers because of your understanding of suffering. It's a horrible thing. However, she also did wonderful things. Messy. Complex people. Yeah. 
We are. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you use the mic? Is that okay? You won't. You won't hurt it. It's fine. I know they're kind of scary things initially, but. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, yeah, I worked in a Christian school that was run by a, a church, mm -hmm. and the so the the pastor was the employer of the teachers, and he was aware of a particular teacher's history, mm. and still employed this person who happened to be a homosexual pedophile. Uh. So I don't understand. Was that forgiveness that caused that person to give this person a job? Well, that's, he's now um, complicit in any harm that's been done. Yeah. There's one thing. And there was harm done, yep. So he enabled that harm to be done. Um, sure, maybe that person forgave the one that he employed for the abuses that that person had perpetrated against other people, not him. Um, but the other side of that is that pastor has a responsibility to keep people safe and to make sure that people are not being abused. So it doesn't matter if he forgave them or not. He should never have been given that position. Neither should priests have been moved around. No, absolutely. I agree. And we get, but we get too caught up in this, oh, yeah, but we know they're a nice person, all that sort of thing. Well, Maybe they are on certain aspects, but they also did a horrendous thing by allowing abuse to continue. <coughs> and repentance is being willing to meet the consequences of our actions and be honest about it and then be changed by that. And for forgiveness, you need to be repentant. Maybe it... Sorry. <laughs> you reckon? Is that because we've forgiven everybody who's harmed us and we're all at peace? I, I, I at least, I, because I don't have a Bible in front of me, I can't double check it. But I, I think when Jesus was talking about forgiveness, and to some degree it's reflected in the Lord's Prayer, um... Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive others. Hmm. So that's how we say it. Uh, you could read that as a conditional statement. So let's turn it around and look at the condition. If I don't forgive, Lord, I'm not expecting forgiveness from you. Is, you, you think, I think in another place in the scriptures it makes it even clearer that if you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you, which is a, another dilemma to con kind of ponder on. Hmm. If I won't practice forgiveness, if I won't forgive those who hurt, then I shouldn't have an expectation that God will actually uh, look favourably on me. Mm. He did say that will be retained. Well, this is, this is I, look, I missed the start of what um, Clay said, but yeah, I, I was here when he, when he was referring to that, and I was here this morning when he sort of touched on that as well. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's a challenging thing. Uh, look, I, I, I mean, if, if you haven't made a mistake, well done to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, look, you know, I, mean, I mean, technically none of us are in a place to cast a stone, which is what Jesus sort of did with that lady, wasn't it? So, mm. you know, if, you, if you're guilt-free, you can go ahead and uh, take, it, take out your vengeance on this one. Mm. And, of course, they, no one could. Uh, so the fact that none of us uh, really uh, have the higher position to look down on anyone else, mm. it kind of encourages me, at least from my own processing of this, is to be generous and kind to others, mm. but to recognise that we're flawed and we're going to make mistakes. So it's mm. what we do with those mistakes and those hurts. Mm -hmm. And our society will... Oh, if you tell me lies, I can, I can forgive that. But if you abuse children, well, I find that's really uh, challenging. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we're still grading things. Mm. As, and um, I guess the psychologists would say that someone telling you lies isn't really going to wreck your life. But someone constantly harping on something or, 
or physically abusing you, or sexually abusing you, is going to have a long-term uh, impact that's very difficult to overcome. Mm. Uh, so maybe we're right in sort of evaluating that. But, but mm. the thing that I, I stood up to say is that we shouldn't expect forgiveness from God if mm. we're not willing to pr 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 uh, practice that. Mm. Again, I, I hear what Eli says and, and how much of a struggle it is to continue to, to forgive. Mm. I'm not suggesting, and I don't think you did, that forgiveness is easy. It's just the call of God on our lives mm. to walk in that way. Mm. Difficult as it is, mm. that's how we, we're meant to practice life and to wrestle with that. And, um, I guess we can say in our prayers at night, forgive me for what I've done, Lord, and we can say, because I want to practice that as best I can, mm. and we can sleep well because we've got a clear conscience. Mm. That actually touches, you can see how very early on the, the, that kind of Eastern Orthodox understanding comes yeah. in, because if the people haven't learned to forgive and stuff, well then they're not actually getting that at the end. It doesn't, it's not paradise for them no. until they get to that point, which is interesting. Um, and like anything with this kind of stuff, it doesn't mean anything goes. That's not what we're saying. It's not some soft, wishy-washy anything. It's not that at all. In fact, the path of forgiveness is far more difficult and disciplined than sort of animal reaction to things. Um, and we, I mean, there are, there are things we should say. That's wrong. It's, it, it's not okay in any way, shape or form when, you, when you're hurting other people or that kind of stuff. Um, and forgiveness is incredibly tricky. Very much so. Oh, it's thought -provoking. Topic. Thought -provoking topic. Good, yeah, no, I, I, as I said, I worked on it for weeks. Um, no, but, I was surprised. Yeah, but as Eli said, but I think your situation, Eli, if, if people are still doing things to hurt you, then they're giving you more and more things to go on that journey of forgiveness with. So, so it's very hard to reach that place. It's like when you clean up the house, you know in 24 hours it's going to be messy again because your kids are going to mess it up. So, <laughs> yeah, how do, how do you, you, you can't get to that point of being all ordered and if things are constantly being upheaved again. Excellent. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Continue thinking on it. Uh, and like with anything, if you have like a uh, an amazing insight when you go home or you go home really angry because you disagree with something, um, open up the discussion again. You know, these things are things we need to discuss. But these are really important parts and topics within our Christian tradition, the things that are constantly raised over and over again in Scripture, the things that Jesus demonstrated in his life. Um, one of the things that ends up dividing churches, groups, is when people stick on one big topic that actually has never been central to a religious teaching. Um, and we forget to have these discussions about things that are. Excellent. Alrighty, well, thank you everybody. Thanks for your discussion. We've done a good time uh, this afternoon. If anybody has any suggestions of topics for next month, let me know early and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Anything at all.